So what up guys and welcome back to my channel and today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence once again and in this episode we're going to be talking about support vector machines which is a commonly used algorithm for classification and regression in supervised learning. So let's get going straight away. As always, let's start with the formal descriptions. I'm going to put it on the screen here now again so you can read it while I read it out loud as well. So it goes, in machine learning, support vector machines, SVMs, are supervised learning models with, with associated learning algorithms that analyze data used for classification and regression analysis. A SVM constructs a hyperplane or a set of hyperplanes in a higher infinite dimensional space, which can be used for classification, regression, or other tasks. Intuitively, a good separation is achieved by the hyperplane that has the largest distance to the nearest training data point of any class. I must say, of all the formal descriptions we have been looking at so far, this is the one that is the most complex. But we're really going to break this down to pieces as well, and we're going to get a good description of what's going on. So before we get going, I just want to say that the SVM is a very commonly used and favored classification algorithm, and it's used a lot for, for classification tasks in general. And it's a good algorithm to try out initially if you want to do some kind of classification and then work it out from there. But Let's look here on the iPad screen for a while. So, just gonna, gonna draw it out for you. I found this image on Wikipedia, so it has a lot that we're gonna go through. So, remember the supervised learning part. So, here we have one class that's black, and here we have another class that's white. So, these are two different classes. You can think them of class male and class female, for example. And we know that. A hyperplane is nothing but a straight line in our space that separates, or they don't have to separate, but we want them to separate our, our classes. But it's just a, a straight line in a space. And in a two-dimensional space, that is just a straight line like here. In a three-dimensional space, that would be a, a plane. So if you're thinking you have a three-dimensional graph, then you have a plane over that goes over the uh, all the values for two of the axes and just a plane on, on that third axis. So it's just a plane in a three-dimensional three space. But we can see here that we have a hyperplane that's uh, separating our two classes, right? Our black and white class. So that's perfect. As we can see here, our data is linearly separable. It's separable by one line and that that's great. And so in the thing with support vector machines, if you remember when we talked about the perceptron, is that if we had, I'm just gonna switch application here and, and drop it here instead. So if we had our graph here and we have some classes here, there's one class, and then we have another class here. So the thing here is that this is the perfect hyperplane that could set, okay, it didn't correct it to a perfect one. But you see there, we can say that it's just in the middle. It's like it has the maximum range or, or width to, to any point to the, on the both sides. So you can see this value here is very large and this is very large as well. No, it's not definitely not exactly in the middle, but you see the point. Whereas a line like this is still a hyperplane that separates these values, right? Because it clearly separates the two classes, but it's not a good one because it has such a small value to the closest points here, as you can see. I mean, it's, it, it just barely touches the, the blue point there. So if we would make a blue point that's just deviating a bit up here, then it would be classified in the wrong way. Whereas this hyperplane wouldn't classify it in the wrong way. So we want our class, our hyperplane to have the maximum width to be the optimal hyperplane for all of our points. So when we get a new point that we've never seen before, we still classify it in the right way. So this is something that support vector machines, they uh, do very well. So in the case here, we have our support vectors and that are points that kind of create these optimal hyperplanes, right? So as you can see here, this is a support vector and these two are support vectors. And they have the maximum width here, uh, the maximum margin uh, between the hyperplane and the two uh, classes, the two classification we're trying to, uh, to uh, yeah, two classes we're trying to classify here. So that's the magic with the support vector machine, that they 
optimize and make the uh, margin or the boundary there uh, to uh, between the hyperplane and the two classes the maximum the, as large as possible so in that sense when we get another point we do really well when uh, in trying to predict what class that is as well because we don't have a misaligned hyperplane uh, somewhere just that's just enough to fit to the training data so that's really powerful having some problems removing here okay cool there we go and but we we have a problem here as well. Let's say we get another dot here. Um, we get another dot right there, and one right here. As we can see, these dots are now inside of this boundary, right? They're inside of our margin, and that's not good because. What we have in support vector machines is hard margin and soft margin. So the hard margin would be that we don't allow any points to be in, inside of this, you know? We don't, we just don't allow that. We don't, uh, so in this point here, when we have our boundary or support vector set all the way here, that wouldn't work, right? Because if we had the points right here, we couldn't have this large width. So then we would have to move this hyperplane up a little bit. So it goes here instead. And then our, this would be our support vector. Do you see where I'm going there? So with the hard margin, we don't allow any points to be inside of... Uh, inside here of our, our margin here. So we don't care that maybe just by aligning the hyperplane a bit to one side and allowing one point to be here we would generalize much better we would m make much better predictions in general we don't care we we don't want anything inside of that margin but in the soft margin we have something called uh, um, slack variables where we allow points to be uh, inside of here and we allow that because then we can generalize much better. Uh, and well, yeah, that's a, a really cool thing you can do there as well, because sometimes it's just not possible to have some kind of linear separation. Uh, for example, in this point, let's say we have uh, another black point here, another male point that's here. Or oh, not there, that's here. In this very sense, the, the data is not linearly separable, right? Because we have this line here now, but all of a sudden, with a really hard margin, this wouldn't work because we have a black point here. So in that say, in this very example, we would really benefit from having some kind of soft margin. Because otherwise we can't really solve it because the data is not linearly separable. So that's favored uh, most of the time. So what you do when you have a soft margin is that you calculate your loss with a hinge loss, I'm gonna put the uh, function up here for you if you find it uh, interesting. And then you uh, solve this hinge loss using quadratic, ex uh, quadratic equations and Lagrange multiplier multipliers in order to find these support vectors. And that's how, kind of fancy math, so I'm not gonna go into that, but basically when we do this kind of uh, dual maximization or the task we're doing in the math, we're finding these points that uh, are the support vectors. So then we can find out what uh, points in our data should we use for our support vector. But the really cool thing here with uh, our support vector is that we can do something called a kernel trick. So what is a kernel trick? So I'm gonna give you another example here. We're gonna clean this up. And the kernel trick is really cool because we, then we can take our data from one dimension to another. So basically we just have all this data and we're like, hey, we can't really do any kind of separation here with this data as it is like right now. Then we take this data and we put it up in a much higher dimension where we hopefully can find a linear separation. So I'm gonna, gonna give you an example here. So let's say we have a two dimensional graph here again. And we have some points here, that's uh, one class. I'm gonna use one black class and one green class. And then we have the other one here, around the, the class we have there in the middle. 
And clearly, this isn't linearly separable. We can't find any line that just, yeah, it's just like not linearly separable. What we can do then is we can take this data from a two dimensional space to maybe a three dimensional space. And the cool thing here uh, is that if we have this, um, this is challenging because I'm gonna try to, to uh, write freehand three dimension here. Let's actually make it a bit more tidy. Um, and what we can think now is if we have the equation, this is uh, x1 and this is x2 here, then we can say this is x1, x2, and the, here we have x1 squared, let's just call it x3, uh, x3. And what we do here in the transformation is that we take x1 and x2, and we take it to x1, x2, and x1 squared plus x2 squared. So we just add a third dimension where we take x1 and we square it and we take plus x2 and square that. And what does happen then? Well, if we think about it, if we take something squared and then we have a negative number, then that negative number becomes positive, right? So if we say this is zero right here and this is zero right here, so you have minus and plus values, then everything that's to the left of this line would be positive instead of negative when we square that value and everything below this would become positive in the x1 direction when we square it. So when we do this, we actually get some kind of value like, uh, like this in our three dimensional space. And then we have up here, all the green values will be because all the negative green values, well, they become positive. Uh, in in both of the x1 and x2 uh, dimensions. And now when we're looking here in the three-dimensional space, when we use the equation down here, well, now we can see that it's perfectly possible for us to find not a line, a hyperplane in this sake, but I'm just gonna draw it as a, a line, or maybe I should try a hyperspace. We can find a hyperspace here that separates all of these values, right? Just uh, think about it as a plank that's very long and it just separates its data. So the green dots are above the plank and the black dots are uh, below the plank. And that's what we're doing here. So we take the data from two dimensions to three dimensions and there we can find a linear separation. And that's wonderful. And that's one of the magic tricks with support vector machines that we can take the data and we just smash it up to a really high dimension. And from there we can find some kind of separation. But it's also a bit of a problem, right? Because when we're looking at this data later and we're trying to interpret what's happening, it could be really tricky because something that is a straight line in a three dimension or maybe let's say 80 dimensions, it won't be a straight line in two dimensions. So then when we look at the line that the uh, our algorithm found using the Lagrange multipliers and finding the support vectors, maybe it looks something like like this, you know, not exactly like that, but you see my point, it, it doesn't have to be a straight line in two dimensions. So it can be really hard to interpret what it actually means. But yes, it's super cool. And another thing you can do here is that using support vectors, um, SVMs, we're not bound to using a, a Lanier kernel. We can use a kernel such as a polynomial. That's what we did down here. We just transform our data with a polynomial kernel instead and did some polynomial uh, transformation. But we can also use something as uh, a Gaussian or RBF uh, radial basis function. If you're interested in that, just Wikipedia. I'm not gonna explain it right now. Um, but basically an RBF is not bound to having a straight line for the separation between classes. It has this radial basis function instead, which can look something like this. So in this example we have up here, then we can have an RBF that, well, it's a circle and it, it doesn't need to do any transformation really. You can just find it right there. So for some uh, classification tasks, this is depending on the data we use. We don't know what the data looks like, if it's linearly separable or not, or if it's better to use a RBF function or not. But in often, uh, it could be really nice to try this different kind of uh, 
uh, kernels out and uh, yeah, you'll see what suits you best and suits the data best more specifically because I don't think you care too much about which one you use, but your data certainly does if you're gonna get a, a good evaluation of the, or a good classification results. So this is just a crash course into how SVM works. And I really hope you uh, found this very rewarding and that you learn a lot and that support vector machines aren't as fussy fussy and like, what is it any longer? So if you have any feedback or questions regarding support vector machines or my videos or anything you would like me to talk about, I would super glad to uh, hear about them. Or if you just have any like, thank you for putting this up or I finally understand support vector machines. That could be really nice for me to know as well that you actually learned something um, watching this video. And that's great feedback for me to, be, to do better videos in the future. So if you want to learn more about artificial intelligence and machine learning and programming in general, maybe you want to learn to program. Well, I really recommend you to subscribe to this channel and just hit up the all the coming videos as well, because there's so much valuable knowledge just straight to you if you do that. So as always, I hope you have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll talk to you soon again.